resumed and is now time for questions to the Minister of Health. And I call Patsy McLone. Here are Patsy McLone. Cash Dever again. I can call you question number one. Um, I thank the member for his question and I acknowledge the dedication of all independent care home providers and staff who continue to work tirelessly to provide care to residents under the challenging circumstances that have been presented by the pandemic. Unfortunately, there remains a number of families who have not as yet been able to successfully set up care partner arrangements for their loved ones. The Department and PHA are supporting care homes to implement the full visiting and care partner arrangements. The most recent figures indicate that almost 80 per cent of care homes are facilitating indoor visiting when they can and can be done safely, and just over half of all care homes now also report that they have care partner arrangements in place uh, where this is appropriate for a resident. Trusts are working with individual care homes to provide the support they might require to move forward with the facilitation of safely managed and meaningful visiting arrangements and the implementation of the care partner concept. As well as trusts, the Health and Social Care Board and PHA are working with those homes who are finding implementation more challenging, identifying and sharing good practice. The RQIA will also assess the approach being used, and including when undertaking inspections of care homes and compliance with the visiting policy and practice, will actually be material consideration in the inspection and regulation of each care home. Funding has been made available to help homes implement the approach set out in their regional guidance. And for the period of the 4th of March, 373 nursing and residential care homes have been paid £6.52 million in funding for staff support in respect of care partners and visiting. Supplementary, Pastor McGlone. Uh, thank you, but the Minister has in fact covered both the questions that I was going to ask, so well done. Uh, thank you. Moi uh, Foster. Question number three has been withdrawn. And I and uh, yeah, I call Colm Gillerney. <laughs> Cormac Agat, can I call you? <laughs> Agat. Um, and thank you for your answer, answer, Minister. And I suppose I would be concerned that, that you have identified there the fact that only o- just over half of the homes have put in place the care partner scheme. But do you understand the comments of the Commissioner for Older People, Eddie Lynch, when he says that he's not convinced that the Department understand the full extent and impact of the lack of visiting access at present? Um. I have had conversations with the, the Commissioner for Older People in regards, and he did not use that language uh, to me. In fact, he understands the support that we have been uh, given to care homes, also to those families who want to, to make those visits, especially when we are seeing challenges in specific care homes. I have asked the Commissioner for Older People, he has put out a call that he shares any concerns he has with either specific care homes or sections or, or care home providers as a whole. Uh, so that we can engage fully and so the Health and Social Care Board can provide that support and guidance so the Public Health Authority can supply the, the uh, additional uh, support and guidance and also so that the RQIA can also be involved as well so that we can get as many care partnership arrangements set up in place. We have put available for those who enter into the formal care partnership arrangement availability to, for early availability to vaccines through the care uh, section at that point in time and also in regard to access to testing. I call Alan Chambers. Uh, Minister, uh, I thank you for uh, your answers and for bringing forward the Care Partner Scheme. Uh, this is an extremely emotive issue, and all parties involved, and, and, and you yourself, Minister, only want what is best for care home residents. Can the Minister tell the House some possible reasons why some residents have not been able to set up care partner arrangements with their families? I think there there is an ongoing um, challenge in regards to possibly some care homes in in regards to the support or the understanding of what their responsibilities are to ensure that there is safe uh, and effective visiting uh, now that it is uh, possible under the surge level four conditions that we're at. So it is uh, we're fully intended into supporting those care home providers, but also uh, where need be, giving them that bit of extra encouragement, shall we say, should they be failing to do that as well. Because we do value and we do recognise the importance that a visit from a loved one actually does have and the benefit that it brings to someone who is in a care home and is not resident uh, in that setting. Palm Cameron. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank the Minister for his answer so far. Um, given where we are within this pandemic and given the huge success of the vaccination rollout to date, um, and also the corresponding 
data that we have in terms of serious illness of our older population, is it time to look at moving on from the care partners, given that it has worked for, for some very well, but it has also been um, underutilised by, by very many people? Um, would the Minister also consider what help can be provided to the care sector in terms of indemnity, given the issues that have arisen uh, for care homes in particular in providing COVID um, insurance going forward? Um, and I thank uh, the member the, the point that she makes for the additional assurance costs, and, and that's why my department have made that additional funding uh, available for for care homes, so they can pick up uh, other costs associated to COVID. In regards why we still supply, uh, if necessary, that free supply of PPE, and also in regards to the supports that we've given through trust staff, uh, supporting those homes where there is challenges as well. Uh, but I will say, in regards to the care partner process. Uh, process when we first identi identified and utilised it here, it was taken up by other jurisdictions as a way of actually opening up care homes, uh, so loved ones could have those visits. We still, I suppose, remain the, the challenge. In fact, by it still as a vital tool. Uh, we still, as uh, a region, are at level four in regards to the pandemic. So we just re recently moved the first of this month, moved from level five to level four, which we use and all other jurisdictions use as an indicator as to what visit and we. Uh, can facilitate both in care homes but also in hospitals as well, so that it does follow that very set criteria. So care partners are still uh, a vital tool to allow that uh, visiting and facilitate it, but also support those family members so they understand uh, that there are additional supports there for them, as I have said, you know, early access to the vaccine that we supplied, but also regular testing as well to give that assurance, uh, not to just to themselves but to the care home and to the loved one that they are visiting. I call Melissa McHugh. I remember Melissa McHugh. Gramaga, Concorla. Question to uh, Question to Minister. And I, I thank the member for his question. As Minister of Health, I understand fully the importance of day centres and the provision of services to meet the wide and varied needs of people with a physical or sensory disability. The strategic location of day centres for adults with physical or sensory disabilities across Northern Ireland is a matter for the Health and Social Care Trusts to determine in partnership with the Health and Social Care Board as the Commissioner of the Services. There are currently no plans to augment the existing service provision with an additional centre located specifically in the West Tyrone area, and neither are my officials nor their Western Trust colleagues uh, are aware of any specific demand from the local community or, or individuals requesting that such an additional facility should be provided. There are currently two day centres for adults with a physical or sensory disability in the Western Health and Social Care Trust area, Glen Oaks in Londonderry and Drumcoo in, Ennis, in Enniskillen. In addition, service users can avail of day care provided by the independent sector across the region. The Trust's adult physical disability service have contracts with a number of independent sector providers in the West Tyrone area which include the Straban and District Caring Agency, the Leonard Cheshire and the Cedar Foundation. Within West Tyrone, whilst these services are working at capacity, there is no existing waiting list for access to the day centres. Increasingly across the sector, we are seeing that demand from younger people with disabilities is for day opportunities, actually through self-directed support. This is based on an assessed need and means that individuals can make use of a direct payment in lieu of traditional day care. This model of care allows for bespoke arrangements to be put in place to meet their individual needs and enables people to avail of the activities at weekends and in the evenings. I call Melissa McHugh, supplementary. Uh, uh, thank you, Minister, for your answer. And you know too that I have also requested uh, one to look at that type of provision that exists. I think it's in Middletown and Armagh, and then in Carried Off as well too, in terms of that sensory care type facility for young people and, and adults uh, who, who uh, have those types of difficulties and problems. And I'm amazed that there hasn't been any um, uh, point made to the trust in our area, because I've had parents in tears talking about that type of provision uh, where they find it so difficult to cope with those that are suffering from it and would avail of it very, very much. So and I'd ask you, Minister, if you would actually consider locating such a service in the Stavan area that would service that part of West Rowan and Fermanagh. And I thank the member, and I think if I recall right, I think he has written to me in regards to the autism uh, provision and services as well, and I know it's something 
that he, that he has raised before, and as I said, and, and he has said, to, I think acknowledged in my answer that we have received no no requests either at the Department of Health or actually through the Western Trust. I'm sure if the member wants to make direct uh, contact with with the Western Trust and raise those issues, it's something that they will look into and something that we can progress. Then, should there be a need in the facilitation. Uh, for access to those services, but I think, as I said earlier, the specific in regards to young people, um, I, I would encourage the, the member also to direct them, if, and if necessary, we can provide additional information as to how they can actually look for day opportunities through self-directed support as well, so they can get a more tailored, uh, personal approach to, to the support that they do need as well. But if, if the member wants to engage with the Western Trust, and then ourselves will follow up on it. Nicole Rosemary Barton. Thank the Minister for his answer so far. Uh, these day centres have proven to be excellent for treating Alzheimer's and dementia and many other afflictions on that society have. Will the Minister commit to bringing up the issue of creating physical and sensory disability day centres across Northern Ireland with the Finance Minister who controls the funds that would allow this to happen? And I think the member, and I suppose she, she does indicate the pressures that we're under, where we get many requests to to increase uh, facilities or provision on, on support to individuals, is dependent and is based on the financial support that that I get through through and from the finance minister. Uh, but in regards to looking at what we we can do uh, and should do, um, as we're aware, well aware that there has been. Um, and under provision, especially in mental health uh, provision over, over the last number of years, and it's something that we do want to, to do. Uh, in regards to the provision of, of daycare services, specifically, I suppose, in, in the Western Trust area, the pri primary challenge, whether it's actually for provision of daycare or day opportunities, often comes back to you as well, and the member will be aware of this is transport, uh, especially in the rurality. And furthermore, the Western Trust has a number of individual service users who have complex needs and also who require skilled staff to accompany them to meet their nursing needs and administer medications. So there's all those additional uh, ancillary costs and challenges as well that do have to be funded as well. But it's always something that I want to look to, to, to improve and, uh, the support that we do uh, provide to those who need it most. Mark Durgan. Call Mark Durgan. Jeremy Elgood, I can call you and I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. The Minister has spoken of the challenges facing his department, and, and we, we don't doubt those, but we can't underestimate the challenges facing people out there uh, living with disability, and particularly those today living with autism. Does the Minister envisage an expansion of physical and sensory disability services as being part of the fully developed autism strategy later this year? And I, th I thank the Member. Uh for, for that question, because I'm glad he acknowledges the autism strategy that we did uh, actually just launch uh, last week. It is important that we get as much feed into, into that uh, as is possible. Um, and in regards to the delivery of future services, you know, I think it's important that the Western Trust uh, engages as well to scope demand for any additional facilities that they need, should it be day care, day opportunity in their locality. Um, and again, I know that work has been started and is supported. Um, it has been commenced actually through the personal public involvement events, um, which I think were actually held in Straban as well. So the service user engagement and informal care engagements events will again commence soon uh, in regards to how we take forward that strategy as well. Call Mark Bradley. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers so far. Question four. Um, and I, I thank the member. And uh, as the member knows, COVID-19 has reinforced the need to rebuild our health and social care system in new and um, better ways. Firm foundations for change have already been laid with key initiatives such as the multidisciplinary teams in primary care and new day case elective care centres put in place. Upskilling of the social care workforce rolled out, a new rapid response mental health hospital liaison service put in place and a commitment to put in place 900 additional nursing and midwifery training places by 2022. As we emerge from the latest COVID-19 surge, I am determined to rebuild as quickly as possible. 
This will include both the stepping up of elective care services, but also the reshaping of existing services. And that will be informed both by the work that we have progressed to date and the learning we have gained as a result of the pandemic. A key priority for rebuild is the need to return critical care to its usual position to facilitate an increase in elective care. I have agreed the de-escalation of the ICU and rebuild of elective care will follow a number of key principles. These will underpin the Trust's uh, rebuild plans for April to June 2021. These principles include the de-escalation of the Nightingale facility at Belfast City Hospital. Another critical step in rebuilding the system is the introduction of the Health and Social Care Bill, which has been introduced to the House this morning. And that bill will facilitate the closure of the Health and Social Care Board and transfer responsibility for strategic decision back and back to my department. It will streamline our structures, reduce bureaucracy, and enable our resources to be better coordinated. As ever, our ability to rebuild will be heavily predicated on the resources available to do all that we need to do, and a multi-year budget is critical to the planning uh, to achieve sustainable long-term change within our health service. Marsh Bradley, supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and the minister has answered in part what my supplementary was. But uh, as we come out of the, the current restrictions, Minister, uh, do you envisage the decentralisation of acute services, uh, in particular elective surgery, to other hospitals across Northern Ireland, particularly as we are facing a ma- massive backlog in, in uh, treatments like cancer and other deferred acute and surgical procedures? And I think that, no, the member will be aware of the approach that I, I have taken recently in regards to looking at our service rather than a centralised process as a regionalised process so that we can make best utilisation of the facilities that we have around uh, Northern Ireland to make sure that we can get best use of our staff, best use of our operating theatres and best use uh, of the footprint that we we actually have. So it is about looking where uh, we can establish what is now known as green pathways for care. Uh, in those locations where we are seeing a small number of COVID patients being supported, so we can actually critically upscale uh, the rest of those service provisions. The member will be aware of the, the, the elective care unit that we've established in Lagan Valley and the other, the other sites across Northern Ireland that we're trying to utilise at a regional basis rather than just solely within the, the trust setting. Whatever the ultimate reshape of the health service, there is still going to be a critical need for adequate surgery, or a, a surgical departments. Could I draw the Minister's attention to the quite unsatisfactory situation at Antrim Hospital, where, because of underinvestment, the, surg- the surgical department was unable to provide a safe green pathway for cancer patients? Uh, during the recent pandemic. And what is his response to the Northern Trust's request for a new theatre, for a new critical care block, and for a new ward block? It's quite clear that Antrim cannot continue to serve needs without those. You know, and I, I, th- I think the member I know is an issue that he has raised, and I know it was a specific in regards to, I, I think, one patient or one, one constituent that, that had approached him who, because of our regional approach, was able to get the operation elsewhere, although not in Antrim. Um, also, in, in regards to the concerns that the, the surgeon uh, based in Antrim raised with the member itself, he is right. Long-term underfunding uh, of that hospital did not allow it to be in the shape that it needed to be, especially when we saw, particularly in the Northern Trust region, the large number of COVID patients that came forward, so that we, when we had to move our IC ward out onto one of the other main wards so that we could support a high number of COVID patients who needed that support from ICU, it will take time for us to come back down from that provision. But it is also at that important time that when we look to the revenue budget that I have in regards to updating what is a relatively new hospital, uh, if we had been looking at the continuing funding and support 
uh, of the Northern Trust on a regional and revenue basis along this along the entire pathway over the last 10 years we wouldn't have been in the situation we are now whereas we know we've already looked at the Northern Trust and Montgomery Hospital specifically in regards to how it was able to reshape and re-image its emergency department because even with the relatively new hospital and new design that was necessary in the past number of years so when the Northern Trust puts forward those business cases and business proposals we will consider them within the round of the funding that we have available. Remember Carol Nicollin, or called Carol Nicollin. Gormiaga, can call you and thank the Minister for his uh, responses thus far. Does the Minister accept that um, safe, compassionate, accessible abortion services in line with legislation must be brought forward by his department immediately? And again, the member, I think, uh, follows on from a debate that is had uh, in this place yesterday. And I will be clear to the member. Uh, I have said from the beginning that the establishment of a commissioned abortion service in Northern Ireland is cross-cutting and controversial. That is the legal advice that I have received. It is the legal advice that I will follow. And the member knows, having received that, I would be in breach of my ministerial duty if I did not bring it to the executive. And should I not, and should I decide, or should I even want to take that as a direction uh, under my ministerial role, under my department role, it would be one that would be called in and challenged. So the member knows, I think, well, and uh, I was disappointed, uh, Mr. Speaker, that my position was misrepresented in this House yesterday by a number of members who were in full knowledge that this matter is cross-cutting, controversial, and must be one that is decided by the full executive, and it would not be for, for me alone to move. Well, Paul Bradshaw. I welcome during the week there the announcement of the additional funding for community and voluntary sector groups that deliver on health care. I'm just wondering what your department is going to do going forward to make the community and voluntary sector more sustainable. And I'm talking specifically um, the charitable sector, like our hospices, who are providing vital services, not just add-on services, going forward, because we should not be getting them to rely on cake sales and other fundraising events to provide these vital services. Thank you. And I thank the member, you know, and I do acknowledge the, the, the work that our hospices have done, um, not just over the past 12 months, but also over the past number of years. Their, their funding is also mentioned in the New Decade New Approach. There has been an ongoing issue in regards to how they are funded centrally and what funding they receive from Central Resource. In regards to that conversation continues with the Health and Social Care Board uh, and with representatives of my department to we get to a, a satisfactory resolution from both sides. Uh, the hospices in Northern Ireland have received additional funding from my department, but also directly from the Department of Finance uh, during this, pan this pandemic as well, because we have acknowledged that, particularly in regards to the services they, they supply, they do rely on a considerable amount of voluntary contributions uh, and people supporting them in that way. So it was right that the executive centrally supplied that additional funding during this time. Remember Linda Dillon. Call Linda Dillon. Question number five. Um, and again, uh, I, I thank the member for bringing this, this topic to the House. In terms of records held by Muller and Baby and Magdalene Laundry institutions or by other organisations on their behalf, in December 2020, I wrote to the holders of those records and the Health and Social Care Board to request they ensure that all reasonable steps are taken to preserve the records in their possession and that they are maintained in keeping with the best archival practice. I also requested that they immediately suspend any routine or procedure for deleting or destroying any such records and ensure the suspension remains in place for the duration of any further investigation. My correspondence also made it clear that all staff and former staff, where appropriate, should be notified of the ongoing need to preserve the records and that reasonable steps should be taken to ensure that any agents or third parties do not delete or destroy potential relevant records. Supplementary, Linda Dillon, Castella. Gormayoga, Ken Corleone, thank the Minister for his answer. And Minister, I, I appreciate that you have written to the organisations, but I think we really are at a point now where we need to, to move a step further because you are relying on them to do the right thing. If there is a need for legislation or if there is a need for further moves in relation to this, what are the Minister's plans? I wrote to you back at the beginning of February, which is 
over six weeks ago now, and I appreciate that your department is under severe pressure, but I would have expected a response of some description, even an acknowledgement at this stage. We have people who are finding themselves in a postcode lottery just in relation to tracing services, and that's without even the difficulties they challenge around accessing their own records and their own information. So can the Minister give some assurances on what moves he plans to make and if there is legislation going to be required in, in terms of ensuring delivery for victims? I thank the member and also you know, I thank her for acknowledging the, the, the large number of correspondence cases and AQs and that we are currently dealing with at the minute. I will say to her the remit for the independent investigation into mother and baby uh, and Magdalene laundry institutions will be shaped uh, by victims and survivors, as she referred to, with the, su the support of the Truth Recovery Design Panel, which I'm sure the member is, is, is where well has been appointed. I'm confident that the issues around access to and the protection of records relating to mother and baby and Magdalene laundry institutions will be fully considered by the co-design process and the independent investigation into these institutions, so the individuals that she directly refers to and who have been in touch with her have actually input and feed uh, into that process as well, because this is about co-production and co-design, and that is something that the executive has been very clear about in regards to how we take forward uh, this independent investigation. Call Jonathan Buckley. Indeed, uh, I thank the Minister for his response. The report from the Interdepartmental Working Group quite evidently highlighted a shameful and dark period in our recent history. Could I ask the Minister what conversations he has had with his Republic of Ireland counterpart into the relation and nature of the independent investigation as to what powers it will have to call witnesses from other jurisdictions? I, I thank the member for his question. I did have uh, an initial discussion with uh, my counterpart in the Republic of Ireland, I think the, the Minister for, I think it's Minister for Children, I can't remember his name, apologies, uh, a number of months ago, but I do know since uh, this has been taken forward now by an inter interdepartmental uh, piece of work and approach that the First and Deputy First Minister also had uh, meetings with, with him, along with Judith Gillespie, who has been in regular contact as well as to what uh, aspects and what direction um, any uh, and the independent inquiry will actually take and the need and necessity for sharing information in both jurisdictions because of, uh, as of the nature of what will be necessary as we get to the bottom of this piece of work. I call Christopher Stafford. Number six, Mr Speaker. Um, and I think the member, you know, and the member will be aware that you know, I, I deeply regret um, that anyone has had their surgery or medical procedure uh, postponed or delayed. But these critical decisions are very distressing and are never taken lightly, because the downturn in elective care has been a consequence of unprecedented pressures that the COVID-19 pandemic has placed on our hospitals over the past year. From the 17th of March 2020 to the 5th of March 2021, a total of 16,938 procedures, operations and diagnostic tests have been postponed. However, it is important to note that that includes cancellations for all reasons, not just COVID-related. Uh, procedures are often cancelled for a myriad of other reasons, such as clinical circumstances, patient cancellations or staff pressures. Nevertheless, I am assured that every attempt is made to protect the most urgent appointments uh, where this is achievable and the postponed test procedures and operations will all be rescheduled as quickly as possible. To that end, my department has commissioned trust rebuilding plans for the three-month period from April to June, and I will publish detailed activity projections, and these will be published alongside these. While the number of COVID patients in hospital and in ICU have reduced in recent weeks, the emergency, or the emergency from the latest wave is slow, and the situation remains extremely challenging. Trusts are keeping the position under daily review in order that they may reinstate and resume surgery fully as soon as capacity is safely available. Christopher Stafford, supplementary. At the commencement of this crisis, the phrase biblical proportions was used by the Minister to describe the scale of the challenge that we are facing. Given the answer that he has just provided, what assessment has been made by the Department of the biblical proportions of uh, cancelled surgeries and the impact that that will have going forward? I think the member is, is, is well placed in, in the position that, that he takes. It was one of, and it still is, one of the biggest challenges 
uh, that face, faces my health service and all those who work in it, a health service that has been underfunded, under-resourced and undervalued for the past 10 years. And unfortunately, when we saw the complete uh, escalation and pressure that this global pandemic uh, placed on our health service, the drastic decisions that were needed to be taken were not taken lightly either by my department or by trusts or by clinicians who made these decisions in regards to what services had to be scaled back so that we could support those patients coming forward with COVID-19. But I am assured and I'm reassured when I see the rebuilding plans, when I engage uh, with our trade unions, when I engage with the Royal Colleges about their desire to get back up and running as fully and as quickly as they can, but also as safely as they can as well. So that ongoing rebuilding framework that we continue to do, as I said, we'll be republishing that next three months, uh, April to June. Uh, rebuilding schedule within the to by towards the end of, of this month because we have made it clear we're going to take it in that three month blocks so that we can escalate proportionally and with as much speed and dedication as we can. But as I said in an earlier response as well, we do have to look at a regional approach so that patients are willing uh, to travel outside their own trusts and their own areas where they would usually have been seen. Because what we're now seeing is our health professionals, surgeons, uh, willing to travel from Belfast to utilise operating theatres in the SWA and other areas as well so that we can get full capacity of the health footprint that we have but also full capacity that we can to get as many, many, many patients as is possibly reseen as quickly as we can. That ends the period for a list of questions and move to topical questions and I call Claire Bailey. Speaker. I'd like to ask the Minister, Mr. in response to a question from Mr. Alistair yesterday during, um, here, here sorry, on the floor, you, in response to finding out that the Republic of Ireland had issues with the AstraZeneca vaccination, you had let the House know that you had asked your Chief Medical Officer to review the terms of the Memorandum of Understanding. I'm wondering if you can let us know what is being reviewed under the MOU uh, and how you will be moving forward with it? I, I think the member, our, our current memorandum of understanding with the Republic of Ireland is, is about the sharing of information, data quickly, efficiently, so that we both know uh, in either jurisdiction what is happening or decisions that the other one will be taking. So I was uh, disappointed to, to receive the notification that the Irish Republic uh, were actually taken in regards to uh, through AstraZeneca that I found out through the media. So I've asked the Chief Medical Officer to engage with his counterpart, who is the co-signatory, to make sure that we realise the full operational value of that memorandum of understanding and to prevent such reoccurrences happening again, because it doesn't help either of us when either of us are actually blindsided by a decision that has been taken in either jurisdiction. Claire Bailey, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And I see there's a report um, out from an EU committee today to say that there is no evidence of negative impacts from the, vac from the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, is, have you sought any assurances, or have you been given, more importantly, any assurances from your counterpart in the South that, um, that they can go ahead and, and use the vaccine again? In regards, and I think you know, in the urgent uh, oral that was brought yesterday, and I think allowed us to update, we'll take our guidance from the MHRA, uh, that guidance of the safety and efficacy of the Oxford AstraZeneca has been repeated by the World Health Organization, by the European Medicines Agency. Uh, so I, I struggle to see why uh, the authorities in the Republic took the decision that they did, but it is their right to do that. I'm just concerned that it has an overall impact on their vaccine process and also discourages people in the Republic of Ireland in regards to the efficacy of the Oxford AstraZeneca, something thank thankfully that we have not seen here in Northern Ireland. And in fact, in the answer that I gave yesterday, uh, when we opened up our vaccine portal to over 50s, we had 30,000 people uh, in three hours were willing to come forward for the vaccine. And I know the member was was one who got, got, got her, or well, haven't got her, but got the booking as well. So, and again, I thank her for her support and her endorsement of not just the, the vaccine, but also those involved in the vaccine process, because it is an amazing achievement, I think, for our, our National Health Service to see it in full operation, also from those who work for, in it, but also the volunteers who are taking part supporting them as well. Christopher Salford. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Does the Minister believe that the data informing government decisions around lockdowns is too complex to be shared with the public? 
Um, no, I don't. Uh, and I was thankful that the newsletter actually uh, printed an apology. That that headline that they put out when it said that was actually in quotation marks and was not a direct reflection of anything that I had said. Christopher Stalford. Thank you, sir. That being the case, I presume the minister will therefore be publishing the data that's guiding decision-making processes. Um, that being so, that data and information is already available on my departmental website. It is already available on the COVID-19 dashboard. It's already available on the public health agency's uh, dashboard as well, where we look in regards to where the, the trajectory of the virus is taking. Also, the R papers that we uh, produce, uh, which supplies more than just the R number uh, that we use to inform the executive discussions, is actually published weekly as well on my department's website as well. So I have heard many calls about making data available. Uh, it's there for those who wish to see it. I remember Pat Sheehan. going to call Pat Sheehan. Kieran Corla, uh, the Minister has previ previously acknowledged the benefits of cross-border health services. Could he explain what services will be impacted by his department's de decision to require health professionals to be registered uh, both north and south? Thanks. Um, I, I thank the member for that. I, I don't envisage it being uh, largely um, negative. I don't see it having a big impact because it is a small number uh, of health staff who will have to register uh, on either side of the border. Unfortunately, it's a, an outworking um, of part of the protocol that we've seen. So we are supporting those officials and those. Uh, Th those employees that have to do that, we are supporting them to do that. It was a uh, particular concern that was raised, uh, especially by our, our uh, NICAS, the, 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 the team who transfers those critical patients between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, and the accreditation and certification that they require to do that. Supplementary I've got a Kian Corla, and I wonder could the Minister outline why there is such urgency in uh, making professionals who deliver cross-border services to uh, be professionally registered before the end of this month? Um, I think the urgency is to make sure that we have all bases covered so that there is no, uh, no challenge or, or no uh, ob opportunity for someone to have missed uh, that registration process, which allows them uh, to deliver their professional um, skills and supports on either side of the border should that cross nature be, be affected as well. So it is something that we would encourage all staff members who do have to register in either jurisdiction to do it as quickly as possible to make sure that they are not caught out uh, personally or professionally. We call Jonathan Buckley. When we look back over the period of COVID-19, there will be many points of difference between the Minister, myself and indeed many other parties as to the response. But one thing that we can all jointly take pride in is the vaccination programme, and I thank uh, the NHS for the diligent way in which they have carried out that service. In relation to the withdrawal of AstraZeneca on many European countries, can the Minister uh, indicate, has he received any pressure whatsoever to withdraw AstraZeneca from use? No, and I was thankful for the cross-party support that I received in this House yesterday uh, for the stance that we have taken, because that stance is science-led. It has been led by the guidance and the updated uh, guidance that we received from the MHRA on Sunday in regards uh, to, to that additional information that we sought or that reassurance that we sought after the Irish Republic made the decision that they did uh, on Sunday morning. Thank you. Minister, uh, sadly, what will result in this delay in the vaccine AstraZeneca to the Republic of Ireland and other European countries will be a slowing down of getting their populations vaccinated, which should be the priority of every nation across the world. Minister, could I ask if and when we get to a point where we do have an adequate proportion of our society vaccinated and society back to normal, if there is access vaccine? Has the minister, can the minister indicate has he had any conversations by means in which we can share a vaccine with our friends and neighbours in the Republic of Ireland? I will say to, say to the members a conversation I had with the Secretary of State, and it is also an issue uh, that was raised with the Prime Minister when he was here uh, on Friday, because we are concerned 
about the different rates of vaccination in both jurisdictions. We would like to see the whole island be at the same level, but I will not slow down the vaccination process and procedure here in Northern Ireland. Uh, it would have been unfor- unfortunate that should we have actually shared uh, Oxford AstraZeneca with the Republic of Ireland uh, prior to their announcement on Sunday that that vaccine may have been actually sitting unused. So while I, I am open um, to the sharing of vaccines uh, to make sure that we can get the entirety of this island to a level, my focus and not as Health Minister of Northern Ireland is for the people of Northern Ireland in the first instance. Mr. John Corlea, thanks. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Minister um, what measures have been taken at departmental level with trusts to ensure that domiciliary care packages in those areas where there are voids and have been voids for quite a considerable amount of time and where elderly people and disabled people have been left isolated due to the absence of domiciliary care packages? And I thank the member, and I know this is something that the member is very passionate about because it is something he has raised with me personally, specifically in regards uh, to Mid-Ulster. The Northern Trust has received additional money so that they could uh, support and encourage additional domiciliary care workers for that specific area. I am unsure I do not have a recent update as to the success that they have had, but there is those additional supports have been uh, referred and have been talked about. And thank the Minister uh, for his answer. Y- yes, additional resources uh, appear to be there okay, but resources in this instance does not match people on the ground to fulfil those care uh, packages and to make sure that, again, those disabled, isolated, often elderly people in poor health are getting the support that they require. So I wonder, as the Minister, is there any mechanism by which the Minister can ascertain the delivery on the ground in terms of extra personnel to support people living on their own in isolation. And again, and again it's about that meeting. Uh, you know, the care home packages that currently are, and the member knows this as well as I do as a constituent representative. It's okay funding care packages. It's a different matter getting people actually to deliver those care packages as well. And anybody that I was going to say anybody that represents a rural constituency, but I don't think it's it's solely uh, now a challenge for rural constituencies as well. And I think that was one of the things that I was very clear during the pandemic that we really saw the valuable service that our domiciliary care workers actually provide. They were a service. I referred to them as the Cinderella service. They were often forgot about, never mentioned until we saw the real value uh, that they bring as well. So there is, as I say, that support mechanism has been given to the Northern Trust. Uh, and I'm sure they are engaged in making sure uh, that as many care packages are not just fulfilled financially, but also have the personnel to fill them as well. And I think, if I recall recently, I think the Northern Trust actually has an advertisement out looking for recruitment uh, for for domiciliary care workers in that area. But I can follow up with the member as well. Call Matthew O'Toole. Mr. Speaker, um, to go back to an answer the Minister gave earlier on in relation to uh, cross-border health workers having to register with professional bodies, he mentioned uh, that it was an outworking of the protocol. But with respect, Minister, that's not true. This is something that isn't in the protocol. This is an area where EU legislation was applied in Northern Ireland and isn't now. So because it's not covered by the protocol, these people are having to register. Can the Minister guarantee us that this anomaly will not have any impact on cross-border health care, including the transportation of sick children uh, to hospital in Dublin? Um, and I, I thank the member for, for pointing out that, that correction. But I think it's also um, in regards to the question that Mr Sheehan raised. That's why we want to push as many people uh, to get that dual registration as quickly as possible, so that those sort of opportunities and those missed opportunities don't happen. So we actually see somebody uh, being on the other side of, of the border in, the other, in another jurisdiction where their certification and registration actually doesn't cover them uh, from a liability point of view. Matthew, to his Thank, right? Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, further to that, can I ask that the, that the minister raises with his counterpart in the Republic, and there just is absolutely no doubt that um, that uh, health care on either side of the border is uh, going to be disrupted by that. I appreciate what he said, that he's confident it, people can be registered uh, quickly, but it's just really important that we have absolute clarity on that. Thank you, Minister. Look, in, in regards, my, my officials and my, my department are in regular contact with their counterparts in the Republic of Ireland, and I know this is an issue that has been covered and has been talked about. Members, take a raise for a moment or two. Thank you.